This is George Newbern, the voice of Superman, and you're listening to the DCAU Review, hosted by Cal and Liam, streaming at DCAUReview.com and on your favorite podcast app. There is an alien among us. A superior being from a place called Krypton. Deep in the heart of the city, he watches for signs of danger. Ready to act on a moment's notice. His true name is Kal-El. You know him as Superman. Maybe you ladies haven't heard about me. The future of Metropolis is in the hands of the Man of Steel. Get out! Superman! Get up. He's gonna be busy. I said get up. Superman. Welcome, everybody, to episode 236 of the DCAU Review. I am one of your hosts, Cal, and with me, my good friend, good brother, and the man that runs our Twitter account. That's right. It's Liam. Liam, we are uh, just uh, just another week here at the DC Review uh, as we uh, continue here in our month of Superman, the animated series reviews. We, as we mentioned last week, we did something new for the first time, 235 editions into the pod. As we uh, we broke up our first two-parter into two separate episodes, so we will be reviewing the second part of the episode that we started reviewing last week. This week, that's right. So we have uh, the the second part of the first appearances in the DCAU of Jaxer and Mala in the aptly titled "Blasts from the Past." Yes, part two, indeed. And uh, this episode originally aired here in the States on September the 9th, 1997, which is uh, actually, that that doesn't seem right. September, the the last one was September the 8th, 1997. This was September the 9th. This was a weekday debut. That doesn't make too many. I don't believe that. I think these... (laughs) I think DCAU Wiki might be incorrect with that one, but let's, uh, sure, let's say for for argument's sake, it was September the 9th, 1997. Uh, Here in the States, and of course, Liam, before we get into our uh, review and continue our our review, rather, of this week's episodes, we'll remind everybody we did did have some scores for each of these categories last week, just kind of a our feelers. We put our feelers out. Mm-hmm. Gen- our general thoughts, where we were sitting. Uh, they were not final scores. We will we will have our final scores this week as we kind of settle on individual scores for each each uh, each category here. Before we do, of course, we are going to get our official IMDb synopsis for this week's episode, which of course is brought to you by The Pod Tower. Head over to youtube.com slash The Pod Tower for our entire catalog of episodes, including last week's part one. I don't know why you'd be listening to part two before you listen to part <laughs> one, but maybe you're some sort of psycho that prefers to go out in your own sort of, maybe you're Bizarro. Maybe Bizarro is, is listening <laughs> to this episode. Him, him listen to part two before part part one um and uh, yeah uh, and so after this episode is done if you are bizarro go back on the pod tower youtube.com slash the pod tower and check out part one i uh, also highly encourage you on a very serious note uh, check out our episode we released last week also our uh, in memoriam episode for for the great kevin conroy a, a real raw honest uh, in the moment thoughts from Liam and I, and uh, we've had a lot of great feedback from, from listeners for everybody that tuned in. It's been really, really, really fantastic to hear and uh, get everybody else's thoughts on, on, on how Kevin Conroy's uh, life impacted them. So uh, check that out over at youtube.com slash the pod tower. Yeah, that's right. Uh, thank, thanks everybody for the, just a barrage of really, really nice things. Uh, said about our show and for everybody who kind of chimed in with their own memories and and uh, uh, you know whatever again whether you were feeling happy or sad you know happy at the memories or or sad at the loss um, you know there there were no wrong answers and, and we really appreciate everybody uh, uh, you know 
we're, we all helped. I'd like to think we all kind of helped each other through that. So uh, I, I really appreciate everybody who tuned in and, uh, and uh, everything with that. And then, uh, yeah, as we move on to today's episode, the synopsis for Blasts from the Past Part 2, which was written by Robert Goodman, directed by Dan Reba, with music by Michael McQuistian and animation by Coco and Dong Yang. And that synopsis reads as such. When the Phantom Zone prisoner Mala releases Jack Zur as well to conquer Earth, Superman must de- defeat them despite that fact that they smashed the projector. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, listeners, this is the official imdb synopsis so that's right we, we didn't write this this is this is straight from the source of the official synopsis <laughs> found on the internet movie database so don't hate us you know <laughs> if you don't agree with that synopsis i want to give that five stars just just because of how bad it is but incredible but, yeah incredibly bad it's so 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 it's- bad it's bad in every way. It's not particularly like well constructed English. Mm-hmm. It's it doesn't accurately describe what happens in the episode. Mm-hmm. It's missing details. Like what projector are you talking about? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, just terrible. Just a terrible job. But uh, you know that makes it that makes it way better than <laughs> than a lot of these synopses we read, which are are merely okay. Uh, this one was was funny bad which we always appreciate <laughs> oh so good yes indeed um all right Liam so we pick up in this uh in this episode if you were last recall we last left our hero uh he was he was uh finding a un- semi-unconscious uh, Emil Hamilton or as uh, as one of our listeners I believe it's Ranky Custom suggested this week we missed the very obvious joke of Emil Hamilton um, <laughs> <laughs> as we've commented on his just absolutely fantastic best perhaps top three dcau tans uh we have uh we have emil hamilton recovering from being uh, knocked out and and uh, mala has made off with the phantom zone projector the aforementioned projector as it mentioned in the the imdb synopsis we have to assume it's the same projector anyway <laughs> so that projector was stolen from star labs mala then uh, took it back to the star labs cabin where she decided to release jaxer and introduce him to the planet earth as a potentially a conqueror as we assume as she had turned on superman after he re- refuted her advances and threatened to send her back to the Phantom Zone. So uh, this is kind of where we pick things up here in part two, as, uh, as Superman is actually taking Professor Hamilton to uh, the, the North Pole, uh, to his, his glacierly uh, re- residence where he keeps the zoo. Uh, re- didn't realize until this episode, Liam, that this is the episode, w- uh, I had forgotten that this is where it gets its name of the Fortress of Solitude, as Professor, <laughs> Professor Hamilton suggests that name, much to Superman's uh, chagrin. Superman doesn't quite understand it at first and thinks it's a little bit over the top, but uh, by the episode's end, it seems to have stuck so uh that's that's a pretty cool factoid about this episode my word it's incredible these are the animals i saved off the preserver's ship i come up here every now and then to feed them and steal a few moments to be by myself you know if anyone deserves their own fortress of solitude it's you fortress of solitude Astounding. I could spend a career studying any one of them. I'm sure you could, but right now we should hurry. Oh, uh, yes, of course. Yeah, I like that a little bit. And uh, I think it I think it works as a because it's one of those things where how do you shoehorn in? It's it's called that and it needs to be called that for the series. So how do you uh you, how do you work that in? But having sort of this very uh verbose you know kind of nerdy guy in professor hamilton even though as established last week he's constantly surf- surfing and chopping wood and, <laughs> and, and the just, epitome of masculinity just slaying it with the ladies every weekend but 
he's a, he's a nerd when he's in his work clothes mm-hmm, mm-hmm. uh so i, I like i kind of like professor hamilton giving him the name but yeah there's a uh a pretty fun sequence there as he's sort of taken in by the majesty of the uh of the of the zoo all the creatures that superman uh, rescued from the collector's ship in uh, the main man episodes and then uh, yeah he gets to work as uh, as superman uh it turns out even though you need like superman's dna to activate that computer and the brainiac orb and he apparently if he touches you while he's doing it you can see it too as uh be standing close as, he said uh, as, close. that's true that's true close proximity he's able to see it and uh and he uh by and he's able to uh learn how to put together a phantom zone projector uh although as we come to of minutes later it's uh, it's missing one key ingredient uh, and while we uh, while they are learning that and getting ready to build their projector we cut back to metropolis and see jackson and mala walk through metropolis kind of uh, taking all taking in all of the sites they're sort of remarking how primitive human beings are and uh, how they still use fossil fuels for cars and and things like that and uh, they're sort of a uh, almost run over by a by a uh, he's one of those guys you know that guy that you see in, in if you live in anything resembling like a city uh-huh. and there's always the guy it's like it's one thing to ride a bike but he's got to have like the the <laughs> the aerodynamic bicycle helmet and the shorts and everything and the skin tight like morph suit that only mm-hmm. you only wear if you've been in the tour de france right yeah. exactly so righteously uh mala blows up his bike and, <laughs> and drops it on his head <laughs> and uh causes- definitely concussed that guy right that guy 100 percent permanent brain damage based on the fact that his bike fell from great heights landing directly on his skull even if he's wearing a protective helmet like those things don't protect you from that force of uh of, of an object dropping on your head absolutely but yeah they uh we kind of see mala continuing to wreak havoc at jackster's uh encouragement as jackster's kind of still gaining his strength from the yellow sun um in the meantime we cut back to the daily planet where uh, superman has returned uh, his guys of clark kent and he's sort of walking into the planet as a as a big commotion's going on and and uh, Lois has to sort of tell him to to look at one of the big television screens <laughs> in the in the Daily Planet to alert him that in fact Jaxer and Mala, mostly Mala, in fact, are uh, are causing quite a bit of ruckus downtown, which uh, sends our hero springing into action. That's right, absolutely. And this is where the majority of the episode takes place. We get a huge fight that breaks out between Lois and, or not Lois, Lois comes later, but between Superman and Mala and Jaxer sort of just stands by. We get a very fun sequence that we'll talk about in visuals where uh, where Superman uh, chases after Mala, who has taken away a a mail truck, a United States mail truck, and mm-hmm. is flying over Metropolis with it. And they end up uh, doing some battle in the middle of the of the truck. Superman. Okay, right- hang on, hang on. Just to recap, uh, wanted to return his society to former greatness. Mm-hmm. Let a coup attempt, mm-hmm. attacking the post office. <laughs> <laughs> These parallels do not stop. Not that I'm talking about anyone in particular. Right. You would have to be a madman to draw parallels to anything existing in real life in 2022, the year of our Lord, 25 Mm-mm. years after this cartoon debuted. Come on, Mm-mm. let's let's not let's not make it a mountain out of a molehill. <laughs> no, but you're right. Absolutely. I, I didn't even think about that one. That's that's a that's a pretty great one. <laughs> on the nose, as we t- mentioned last week, The Simpsons has nothing on this episode of Superman. <laughs> Uh, predicting the future but yeah so we have uh we have a mail truck that is that is falling because um malo was carrying it and super superman sort of flies up punches her through it and they're sort of doing battle as the as the mail truck falls down to earth uh there's continued damage 
between the two of them. Uh, Jax Hurst sort of gets in some sucker punches. It's the it's sort of the uh, the equivalent if you're a, if a, a, pran- a fan of professional wrestling, like the guy on the outside of the ring that comes in, that like the snidely guy that's weak, and he just gets it gets in like a <laughs> sucker punch mm-hmm. when nobody's looking. Like the the manager is like punching somebody when the referee isn't looking. It's, <laughs> it's basically the same thing. Jax Hurst gets in a couple of shots, a shot of heat vision, a, a, a punch or two and when superman's not looking but again he's sort of staying staying back because he's not fully up to uh, to strength at this point but that doesn't last for long as superman sort of gets his revenge at that point and is able to to subdue and get jaxer uh, suspended above uh on, on the side of a on the side of a skyscraper at, onto a flagpole he sort of bends the flagpole around him and suspends him there so he can sort of focus his his energy on mala who is at full strength so they continue their battle but uh unfortunately lois gets a little bit too close to the action and uh, Superman is forced to uh, to save her from certain peril as Mala kicks a uh, a series of of uh, I guess they're they're like attached decks outside decks to mm-hmm. uh, on the outside of this apartment building. Sort of there's a uh, a tumbling uh, effect that happens down the side of the building as they uh, as they come towards Lois and Superman has to swoop in. But uh, in the meantime, Jaxer and Mala. Uh, are able to uh, to escape at this point, and uh, and uh, and they are uh, at that point they are able to escape again, and uh, that's where Superman decides to head back to Star Labs and uh, check up to see how Professor Hamilton's doing with attempting to build his new Phantom Zone projector or their Phantom Zone projector at this point, and uh, things aren't going that well. We'll just say that. <laughs> How's it coming, Professor? You're just in time. We're ready to proceed. (sighs) So close. What's wrong? We're missing a crystal that vibrates at the Phantom Zone's frequency. It's the homing signal to the zone. Without it, we can't send anything in or get anything out. But the crystal simply doesn't exist on Earth. Keep trying. Jaxer's getting stronger, and they've got the projector. Somehow we've got to even the odds. Yeah, that's, uh, it's, it's been kind of made clear here that, uh, that they're missing the, the piece of this magical crystal which vibrates at the uh, at the at the right frequency to activate the projector, which can then send things to or pull things out of the phantom zone. And uh, as they uh, as they sort of puzzle over how they're going to fix this problem, we cut back to Harry White sort of reading his reporters the riot act that none of them can can find Jaxer and Mala or have any kind of clue on where they could have gone, despite how. Uh, uh, conspicuous they uh, they tend to make themselves <laughs> but thankfully as uh, as fate would have it a very superman 2 moment uh the cr- very chris reeve superman moment uh jack sir and mala bust into the daily planet and uh in order to get superman's attention what else they kidnap lois and uh, tell him to come to mala's cabin the star labs retreat of course um and uh and from there we get uh superman superman i do appreciate tries to play he he's kind of smart in this scene while also being a little bit dumb uh <laughs> as he arrives in uh in the the of course the anti-kryptonite suit and he uh he brings of course a piece of kryptonite with him to weaken mala and uh as as he sort of has her dead to rights he leaves lois with the rock and goes in search of uh, Jaxer, who is just kind of floating in the air and has, of course, the Phantom Zone projector and uh, uses it on Superman and sends Superman to the Phantom Zone, a very dramatic moment. And then just for the icing on the cake, he, uh, he activates his, uh, his still not quite fully powered heat vision to destroy the Phantom Zone projector and to apparently leave Superman stuck in the Phantom Zone as uh, as Lois kind of vows 
revenge somewhat impotently as they uh, they go off to conquer the world. There are so many ways to kill her I can hardly choose. No. Let her live. She's a reporter. Let her tell her world that Superman is gone forever. I'm going to personally lead the army that vaporizes you, too. Or vice versa. Either way, see you soon. That's right. So, uh, <laughs> well, things look pretty bad at this point. And if, uh, if you didn't know any better, you would say that uh, this was the end of our story. But of course, it is not. Uh, while we get sort of a video montage of, of the news documenting the various travesties that Jaxer and Mala are putting the earth through while Superman has disappeared, uh, creating sandstorms in the Sahara and uh, attacking the United Nations uh, or the UN Security Council and uh, demanding that they surrender or threatening to do further damage. Uh, and the UN refuses at first to surrender, but then it feels uh, like that they have no other choice based on the fact that Jaxer and Mawa, now at full strength, are ready to just continue destroying and threatening to destroy uh, everything until they, they ultimately surrender anyway. So back at Star Labs, Lois is recounting to Professor Hamilton as uh, as these the reports on these disasters are going on and professor hamilton uh, asks her specifically about what happened in the interaction asking if superman was wearing the anti-kryptonite suit and if it was damaged in any way because uh, they apparently had coded his <laughs> this is one of those things <laughs> where i had forgotten this detail and it was uh -huh. Oh. And the fate of the world hangs on questions I can answer? Yes, Miss Lane. Tell me about Superman. Was he wearing the anti-kryptonite suit when they sent him into the zone? Yeah, but... Was the suit damaged at all? It looked a little wrinkled. What does it matter? We treated the suit with a traceable radioactive coating. We realized we couldn't lock onto the homing signal to the Phantom Zone, but we could retrieve our own signal once it was sent in. You can get Superman out of there? If I can find his signal... Wait! There he is! Superman! Can you hear me? Professor? Hang on! We're going to try to pull you back! The signal's weak! I don't know if I can hold on to it! He's in pain! Do something! He's been torn between dimensions! Superman. Don't come too close, Lois. The radiation. In my mind, like in my in my brain, they go and find the little chip. Lois and Professor Hamilton went and found the little crystal, and then they just use that to complete the Phantom Zone. I had forgotten this little thing that they didn't <laughs> the little crystal, and they uh, attempted to they are able to bring Superman out because they had coated his his uh, his anti-kryptonite suit in radiation that would allow them to track the signal in between dimensions because the phantom zone projectors we learned is based on the multiversal theory. Uh, Brainiac goes into a little bit of of uh, explanation and exposition as he's explaining there and begins to talk about it. So they're able to track his vibration essentially by the coating of radiation that they put on the anti-kryptonite suit. Did mm -hmm. you follow that lamb? Yeah, this it's, it's very Mandela effect. Cause I, I like, I could see the scene where they go and pick up the little piece from the destroyed uh, phantom zone projection. So I just assumed they went and got that kind of like what you were saying. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was sure that's how this was resolved. But it's like, no, they, <laughs> they, they had magic radiation and the radiation is somehow trackable, even though they said the only way to track it was through the vibrations of the universe earlier in the episode. And that allowed them. And then I'm like, they start to pull them out and it's not working. And I'm like, oh, OK, because they still need the piece for it to work. Right. And I'm like, okay, so they'll try. It won't work. They'll go back. Nope, it works. 
Somehow it works. He even though he's torn between just dimensions. Keeps keeps uh just keeps twisting the uh <laughs> the various yellow knobs and somehow it works. <laughs> somehow Palpatine has returned. That's right. Somehow Superman returned. He took the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> uh so yeah, Superman is back. He does tell Lois to stay back because of the radiation. He is he is always mm-hmm. thinking of others. You gotta love that about Superman. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh but uh yeah, so at that point. They uh, they decide that now they're going to go scope out the the wreckage of where Jaxer and Mala destroyed the Phantom Zone projector. And wouldn't you know, they are able. Thank goodness that Jaxer's powers run all the way. Otherwise, it would have, may have been incinerated completely. But because they weren't up to par yet, uh, they are able to locate the crystal, uh, this missing piece for the Phantom Zone projector. And at that point. Uh, we cut to the UN Security Council where Jaxer and Mala are about to have the entire world surrendered to them with a very fancy <laughs> document that says terms of surrender. You got to love that Jaxer being the, the general uh, requested that there be an actual like document <laughs> showing that the world is surrendered to them. No take backs. <laughs> yeah terms of surrender you gotta love it (laughs) yeah this is one of those things where this was before we knew it was going to cross over with a thousand other superheroes Mm -hmm. but it is one of those things where like nobody nobody tried like the we know at least like the flash is active right there's a green lantern somewhere in the sector even if it's not kyle rayner yet yep uh dr fate's out there somewhere floating in a tower being sad right like there's <laughs> the demon etrigan is somewhere mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. We, we got we got nobody out here nobody to step right. up and save save the world not that we saw anyway that is uh there's there, there's a potential for another another tie-in comic or uh you know a clone wars type animated series to supplement this and make it make more sense but what was uh, happening where were the other heroes during jaxer and mala's reign of terror yeah, let's, let's do it yeah let's let's retcon some stuff let's just <laughs> let's just make this overly complicated no but yeah the, besides all of that of the uh that side of things not I mean, me not being able to turn off that part of my brain that's going like like Batman didn't try, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but whatever. So it, they were whatever happened. Jack and Mahler are about to uh, have the entire world surrendered to them at the UN, and uh, in comes Superman. In light of the destruction that has been wrought upon our world, it is clear that we have no choice but to surrender the planet to the High General Jack Sur. You should be proud. One stroke of this pen, and billions of lives will be saved. I wouldn't sign that just yet. What? Yes, it is. I think I can negotiate a better deal. Superman! He's back! Oh, thank heavens. Impossible! doesn't bring the projector with him instead he uh he engages jackster and malin a pretty lengthy battle of fisticuffs uh before finally luring them back into metropolis and uh, towards the daily planet roof where lois and professor hamilton are waiting with the projector and lois is the one that gets to uh, do the honors and send both of them back to the phantom zone twist them knobs lois that's right she <laughs> Uh, yeah, I don't know how you teach someone how to do this, but Professor Hamilton was able to uh, <laughs> was able to teach Lois how to how to twist the unlabeled knobs. They sh- again, look, I know the original version didn't have words on it, but maybe maybe now that y- <laughs> that you're in control of it, Professor Hamilton, you could put like you know, get a label maker is all I'm saying. <laughs> put it to put it to use here, but one uh, and off. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> but yes, they're sent back and we get kind of a nice little epilogue as, as uh, Superman's back in the fortress where we see him leave the projector and he, uh, he sort of remarks to himself uh, while he doesn't feel lonely thanks to the, uh, the animals up at the fortress, he, uh, he is still the only Kryptonian. But then he sort of looks back at the projector and decides maybe that's for the best. And uh, that's where we, uh, where we end things for this. Uh, part two that's right so liam 
You and I originally, uh, our scores that we were leaning towards last week uh, at the end of part one, I had a six out of seven, all right, six out of 10 for plot, and you had a seven out of 10 for plot. So I'm interested to see here uh, how much this uh, moved the needle, if at all. Um, being completely honest, I do like there was a lot of action in this episode. It's a lot of fighting. Mm -hmm. uh, the Mala and Superman fight and then the subsequent sort of chase scene at the end. It's funny. I checked the time because this episode feels like it's a lot longer than that first episode. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I checked and there was like three minutes left and Superman is still leading this chase through Metropolis. And despite having seen this episode many, 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 many times, I, I had forgotten how the how the ending came about and who mm -hmm. flipped the switch and who caught them. So it was a nice little surprise to see Lois get the get the honors of, of flipping the knob. But um, yeah, I I don't think I'm going to change my score from the six. I think overall it's, it's an okay episode. I think there's certainly some interesting things that, that are touched on here. It's much more action heavy in the second, second uh, half. We don't get much of a, of a movement of plot. Things move at a rapid pace because so much of the time is, is taken up by the fight. Uh, Superman is barely in the phantom zone. So you barely have any time to react to him being somewhat lost, especially after Jaxer dis destroys the Phantom Zone. Mm -hmm. uh, so you don't really have the time to feel the weight of that. I, I know they tried to do that by showing you sort of the, the disasters that were occurring at the hands of Jaxer and Mala with Superman being trapped, but you really don't get the weight of it, sort of like how you do in... Um, uh, in Apocalypse Now. Like that, that even though Superman is... is it's a similar situation where Superman is sort of out of the picture and then back in the picture very quickly. Uh, you still get the, you, you're able to sort of understand the weight of what has happened without Superman being there with, with the apocalypse uh, invasion. Um, it's visually very different. You can tell things are, are being destroyed. Things are much worse. You don't really get that other than this sort of scene where, you know, the, the UN is signing, <laughs> signing the world over to them. <laughs> they seem a little bit disheveled in those moments and the, the UN building is in, in shambles, but um, it doesn't quite communicate that with, with everything else uh, surrounding it. So I, I don't think that it was as effective as it could be. I did like the action. I did like that it was action heavy. I think with 40, really this episode being 44 minutes essentially, or 42 minutes, you, you had a little bit more story to tell um, and a time to tell a story. And I don't know that that was that was maximized and, and done to the best efforts. So um, it's not a bad episode. I think that uh, with the pacing of part two, I think uh, it does make it feel like a jam packed action heavy episode. And, and that's fun. And that's sort of juxtaposed against part one where there wasn't as much action. I feel, mm -hmm. um, feel maybe if you spaced out the action a little bit more, uh, it, it maybe would have been ranked higher, but I'm sticking with six out of 10. What about you? Yeah, I uh, actually, I guess technically, bring I'm bringing mine down a point to uh, to match your six from uh, where I had at the seven. Kind of for for most of those reasons, it does. It feels very rushed, and this is another one of those uh, Mandela effect things. Because I think when we were watching before I sat down to watch part one last week, my thought was part one ends with Superman in the Phantom Zone. Same, absolutely. Um, but it doesn't. That happens like in the middle of Act Two. Right. And then he's brought back like right at the start of act three. So you really don't have time to like build a sense of dread of like what, what does it mean when there's two evil Kryptonians on the loose and Superman's not here to stop them. Right. Um, and like you said, they don't, we don't really get to, other than some kind of brief uh, news footage. We don't really get to see much of the, the destruction or the mayhem of that. So yeah, it doesn't really feel like, I don't feel like we have enough time to miss Superman or to get like worried about what's going to happen if he doesn't come back before he's back. Right. Um, so I, yeah, I think that I, like I said, I, I liked in part one, like, like we talked about last week, having, having more time with just Mala and having her be more of her own character before she, you know, kind of settles into the the sidekick role in, in this part two with Jaxer and, and kind of seeing what makes her tick. I think that was fun. And then introducing Jaxer and you feel like, oh my gosh, Superman could barely hold his own against one of these people. And now there's two of them. 
Like it feels like you're building up to the big thing. And like you said, the action's fun. And we'll certainly talk about that more in visuals. But, uh, but yeah, I just, I just feel like part two feels a little bit rushed. And, uh, and then, like I said, I, I like the resolution. I like that, especially because there's both in part one and part two, Lois kind of has this little side rivalry with Mala and, and she kind of gets to pay that off by being the one to send them back to the Phantom Zone. I think that's fun. Um, but, uh, but yeah, overall, like I said, I think, I think it's, it was a, it was a fun setup in part one. And I was, I was inching to like this one more than I ended up liking it, I guess. But yeah, again, not terrible. It's still, it's still a fun episode. And, and like you said, pretty action heavy. Um, so there's not, not a ton to complain about there, but as far as a resolution to what was set up and how, how they utilize this, you know, this two-part story i i think uh yeah it just felt like a little uneven like i feel like if we if we move the superman getting stuck in the phantom zone to part one and then act one of of part two is just all you know jackson and mala mayhem and destruction and you have lois and perry and whoever else kind of reacting to all that and hamilton while hamilton's you know frantically trying to build this this projector i think it could be could be really exciting and you know we get to spend a little more time with our our human resistance characters before before you bring superman back and and he saves the day at the end so again not not terrible by any means but like i said i think part two just feels like uh they they kind of rushed through some stuff that uh, could have been given a little more time to breathe yeah absolutely all right, Liam, let's move on to our second category, which is going to be animation and visuals. Uh, last week, I was sitting at a five out of 10 for animation and visuals. You were at a six out of 10. Um, what stuck out to you from this week's episode, which I believe Coco Dong Yang also uh, mm -hmm. accredited with this week's animation? Um, what stuck out for you? First thing that stuck out to me, and I, I, I don't know if this is just the look of a, I don't know if this was more, if what last week was more Coco and this week was more Dong Yang or vice versa, mm -hmm. but everybody was just like a little bit off model for me, especially in the first two acts of the episode. Agreed. Like Jack Sir, especially, he's very like boxy, mm -hmm. I think, and he has like a really weirdly flat head in in a way that I didn't I the sense of last week when admittedly he's only in two scenes last week but i just didn't get that sense and then it, he just he just felt a little bit off i feel like facially both mala and lois looked a lot different than last week do you know what it looked like to me it's like you know when you're typing and you're using a word processor mm -hmm. and you hit the italicize button like that's what i felt like happened in the third <laughs> act with, with with lois and mala and uh and uh and and jaxer like it's like somebody italicized these people i don't know how to explain it other than that <laughs> just that's what that's what it looked like to me they were just all weirdly angled to one side it was very strange yes so yeah I, I just thought i just thought everybody's a little bit off and like animation wise i don't think anything like it's it's pretty you know, fluid there's as you mentioned the the sequence where mala and superman at the start of the episode is the bit where they're bringing this mail truck and the the mailman falls out the back and superman catches them and drops them on like an awning and then goes to fight her and then they have this fight inside the the mail truck and the mail truck is kind of falling out of the sky and spinning around and we see just like glimpses of the fight going back and forth and uh, i think that's a really really cool trick i and thought that I, was awesome yeah, yeah was, i thought my I, favorite sequences that mm -hmm. uh, it 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 in, that I can remember in a long time in Superman the Animated Series. Yeah, it was a really, really cool uh, cool sequence. I thought that was fun. They get back to Metropolis, and, and you have Superman sort of battling Mala, and just the, 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 the sneaky reveal of Jaxer having his heat vision, because he's just kind of been standing there with his, his arms behind his back, I think mm -hmm. is, is really good. And Superman, the way Superman kind of reacts to that, and then, and then as, as they're trying to get away, uh, Mala basically you know kicking down at the one you know apartment balcony and then them all sort of jenga style falling on each other as as they go down towards lois and superman zipping in at the last second i think i think that's all a little bit of fun uh it was just it's the, the only thing like i said that that kept bothering me across 
like I said, I think in the, in the final couple minutes, it's, it, it's different. Like they started to fix, it. I don't know if it was just a different, different storyboard artist or again, or if, if the first two acts were done by one studio and the third act was somebody else, like it, 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 it maybe looked like it had been corrected a little bit by the end of the episode, but yeah, just for a lot of this, everybody looks, looks like weirdly, uh, especially like I kept looking at Jackster. I was like, he was not that square last week. Right. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't disagree with you. Things were, and there's, I don't know how much we've gone into. We've always talked about the different Batman models from Batman the Animated Series, mm-hmm. but there are definitely two Superman models from Superman. There's a, there's a much beefier, like stronger, broader shouldered, wider head. Um, I think that's the TMS uh the tms shows um Mm -hmm. like the the bizarro's world we saw a couple weeks ago like that's that's beefy superman he's like super Mm -hmm. beef super buff um you know real sharp jaw yeah absolutely this this uh storyboard artist and animation studio this is uh superman super kind of skinny like he's a little skinnier version of superman he's more boxy um, I prefer my Superman to be jacked. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna <laughs> like, I prefer big, goofy Ed McGinnis style, uh, like cartoony, overly muscular Superman. So I prefer the TMS look. Obviously, that there was an issue, they weren't gonna get TMS for every single uh, one of these, but this one in particular, I would agree, there was definitely some something off model there towards the end. I would also say that the color palette. I felt like kept changing, especially in the scene where Mala has Superman on the ground and is attempting to get him to, to, to kneel before Jaxer, essentially. Um, Mm -hmm. She like, there's a shot. They keep cutting from behind Superman's head to look up at Jaxer and then back down to like over Jaxer's shoulder down to Superman's face. And every time they went back behind Superman's head, his neck was like a different shade of, shaded color like sometimes it was like dark sometimes it was lighter i even rewound it twice just to make sure i wasn't seeing anything it was just it's very bizarre and from where superman was sitting and where mala was kind of kneeling on his back it would make sense for his neck to be shaded and have a shading over top of it because the sun wouldn't be shining directly on it but it kept changing like the sun just kept moving in the sky so his neck was like brighter in one shot and darker in the other it was very very strange so i did notice that there was also the thing that we talked about last week where there were certain sequences or certain uh particular uh, things that i guess were may have been storyboarded by one individual these close-up shots these sort of uh shots that were designed to to show emotion or like an extreme close-up and for whatever reason there's a shot of superman where his eyes you see the whites of his eyes and it only happens that one time in the entire mm-hmm. show there's one or two times where that also happened with professor hamilton um who also didn't have whites in his eyes in the first first part but then did at various times during part two so mm-hmm. that inconsistency always gets on my nerves like i i just like just just keep it the same, whatever you're going to do. If they're going to have whites behind their eyes, make it that way for the entire episode or keep it uniform. Like don't, don't switch back and forth because it stands out. It's a little bit annoying to me. Um, Other than that, I I will say compliments. uh, Definitely that, that sequence with the falling mail truck. I think, um, I think that the, the fight between that, that was also a, I think potentially a way to hide some of the violence that they were insinuating because as the truck turns you don't see the punches but you see like the the truck bending outward as they're Mm -hmm. as they're sort of being pushed into the different sides or being smashed into the different sides so uh very 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 smart way of doing that if they were trying to limit the amount of violence that they were uh that they were showing um but i i love that when uh when superman uh is is uh being chased down by Mala and Jaxer in sort of the final scene, uh, he gets knocked into this bridge, and there's a uh, there's a truck that stops. Of course, it's a gas it's a fuel tanker, <laughs> a gasoline truck is stuck on this bridge, and uh, and Superman 
is there once again being forced, uh, attempted forced to surrender to Jaxer, and he uses his heat vision to uh, to ignite the truck, and and Jaxer and Mala go shooting into the air, and I love that they both have individual smoke trails that yes. follow them into the sky. I thought that that was hilarious and a great little great little bit there that they they you know almost like they were missiles being shot into the sky on their own um mm -hmm. i loved that uh and i loved the 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 smirk on lois's face as she's able to to capture capture jaxer and mala at the end was was super super on point and then as superman looks into the viewfinder and says parole revoked seeing them back there <laughs> uh sort of struggling once again in the very kirby fight as we talked about uh, uh phantom zone i i enjoyed that and i i would say also the the animation and the the way that they did superman sort of struggling to escape the phantom zone i thought that was mm -hmm. done really well um it, I, you know you get this sort of fading in and out of the scene and superman's very exaggerated sort of struggling and it felt very much like something you would see in a comic book i, I mm -hmm. thought that was animated really well i thought that you really got that he was going through a, a painful situation in that moment but uh, yeah, for all of those reasons, um, I bumped my score up by by two points from from what I where I had it sitting last week. So I went from a five to a seven for this week. I think there is some good stuff. I think there's some great action in this and uh, enjoyable uh, animation. There is some things that are off. There's some things that uh, you know were a little bit wonky as we pointed out. But I think those those high points of those action sequences sort of balanced it out there. So seven out of ten was what I ended up settling on. Yeah, I uh, I ended up with a uh, with my uh, seven out of ten as well. Actually, now that I uh, <laughs> now that I look at my notes, yeah, I I think for for all the reasons, like I said, I think it could have been even higher because, like you talked about, this is a very action packed episode, and a lot of the action is great. I like the sequence where uh, where Mala kind of has Superman pinned down, and and Jaxer instructs him to uh, to tr instructs her to crush his skull, and she just sort of grabs grabs his head and then superman kind of i always like when superman uses the the power set to to problem solve so he can't he can't just throw her off of him so he uses the heat vision to hit a lamp post which falls over and knocks her down like i think that's a that's a really neat little way of of superman getting out of something and kind of outsmarting him and taking him taking advantage of having had these powers for you know years and years whereas they're both still learning i think that's that's a really fun sequence i really like the way that's laid out visually and then yeah you know, sequence i mean there's there's a part where they go kind of above the clouds and you just get this really nice sweeping shot of of all of them flying i think that's that's really fantastically done as well so uh like i said the uh the the off modelness of it like i said especially in the first two backs maybe brought it down lower than it would have been but uh but i think still the uh the the action i think wins out ultimately and you have a you have a lot of fun there in, in this in the second part there you go all right William, let's move on to our next category which is going to be music and uh, i believe christopher carter once again responsible for music this week michael mcquistion oh that's right michael mcquistion my my bad you did mention that at the beginning uh so mr mcquistion responsible for the music this week um did you have anything stick out to you um other than i think my favorite scene in the entire episode uh that was when superman makes his triumphant return uh, in the u.n security council stopping mm -hmm. stopping the world from signing themselves <laughs> over to uh Jaxer and mala that uh that superman theme that came in there boy whew, boy howdy what a great 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 scene great mm -hmm. back backing track there and uh everything about that was great but uh I had a few other notes here, but uh, what about you? Any anything of note for your uh, musical musical notes? Yeah, I really love the. Uh, there's a big kind of very dreadful when uh, when the fan. Anytime the Phantom Zone projector is used, I don't know if we mentioned this in part one. There's this very dramatic uh, theme that kind of kip, kicks in for that. So when uh, when Jaxter uses it on Superman, you kind of get this really dramatic bit and then it kind of kicks into overdrive as he then destroys it and and like we said lois kind of vows revenge as they as they fly off 
uh, I think there's there's uh, there's some cool music used f- to actually represent. And again, it's kind of brought in when, as we talked about the scene where Hamilton and Lois are trying to pull Superman back out of the Phantom Zone. I think it's there's some cool little uh, music added in there. And then yeah, I, I enjoyed the the fight music throughout the uh, that whole final battle there. I think is pretty fun and and frenetic. And I couldn't. I'd have to go back and maybe listen to it a few more times to pick up if there was like a specific jackson and mala theme being used or if that was part of that same piece of music of the that's used during the the phantom zone moments but uh, i i enjoyed the uh the final battle uh music as well kind of keeping up that very uh, a bit more fast pace there yeah i i uh i think that that was finally that was a fine fine backing track for that scene i think the music also in the 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 main fight scene was was pretty solid also um i will point out and i don't know if you noticed this um you might have to go back and listen to it and and let me know your thoughts or uh, the listeners can also but in the final little bit there that we get where superman returns to the fortress of solitude the theme that plays i thought was very very reminiscent of the sort of a a minor key version of the John Williams Superman theme. Fortress of Solitude? I mean, it's not exactly lonely up here, though I am the only Kryptonian. Lately, I'm thinking it's better we keep it that way. It had some of the same notes. It sort of follows the same pathway as as the Superman theme, and as Superman is sort of reminiscing, and as we mentioned, his line about being the only Kryptonian and kind of liking it that way, it sort of fades out. And again, it's not the same notes, and it's played a, sort of in a minor key. But the way that the notes travel up and then back down. Um, it just it just invoked that so much to me, which is interesting because we talked last week, like one of the things that was interesting, mm-hmm. we weren't quite sure why uh, why Zod wasn't wasn't used instead of Jax or why Jax got the got the got the choice. We actually uh, you ended up getting some some confirmation by uh, somebody who w- may or may not be in the know <laughs> with regards to just why Jaxer ended up being selected for this instead of uh, instead of one General Zod. Yeah, I talked to somebody who would who would have some knowledge of of this this week and uh and they they said why while they can confirm uh, fully confirm it, as in they weren't they didn't have firsthand knowledge. Uh, they they kind of signed off on the theory that uh, that things were uh, most likely done that way because they were trying to differentiate themselves from the Christopher Reeve films. Um, and uh, this person also noted that there there was actually a, a kind of oft forgotten. 80s uh superman cartoon uh that ran very briefly that had heavily borrowed and heavily homaged the the chris reeve films so i think this was it was a real kind of statement that they didn't want to do everything which is obviously reflected in in the in the very very different portrayals of krypton and and a lot of the other villains and things that are used here so uh that uh, we did sign on that sign off on that we had seen that in like a couple of articles written about uh, Jaxer and Mala and Zod uh, over the years on some of those fan sites like uh, Screen Ran and uh, and comic resources and places like that, uh, uh, but uh, hadn't really seen like a, a real good source on that. But uh, like we said, we uh, we we chatted with somebody this week that kind of uh, confirmed that for us, and and uh, and uh, that that was a a pretty good theory. So uh, we're we're gonna assume that's true from uh, from here on out, if asked. So maybe just maybe. This was just a little way of sneaking that in there. I don't know. I'd love to hear people's <laughs> thoughts on that. Just having a little bit of the uh, the cr- classic Christopher Reeve, John Williams, Superman style music sneak in there at the end. We don't know, but uh, as as you noted, uh, the the creators were doing uh, very a, a lot, everything they could. I don't know everything they could, but a lot to uh, to avoid 
avoid uh, the the comparisons there. One of the things, by the way, that I missed out that I I would be remiss if I didn't go back and mention. And this is going back to visuals. But did you happen to notice the the homage to the the famous Action Comics cover featuring Superman, the the very first opinion uh, appearance? You no, know, I I had that in my notes and just completely glossed over it when we were talking about it. Yep. Yeah, there's a. <laughs> There's a point where uh, as as they are battling, Superman picks up a car and he's just for a brief second and he's in that that action comics number one pose before he drops it right on Mala's head. Yeah. And there's you know what? Let's tie it all together. There's some great music that accompanies that <laughs> triumphant smash of the car. There you go. Over Mala's head. So um, with with the uh, the music and I, I think in particular that uh, that scene with Superman coming in, uh, I, I got literal chills like I got I got some goosebumps. Mm-hmm. My hair stood up a little bit on that when he comes in and that theme song plays. And as we'll talk about in a second, Tim Tim Daly delivers a, a pretty great line. Um, it's it's pretty good. It's a, it's, I wish there was more of the Superman, uh, Superman, the animated series theme throughout, especially towards the end uh, as, uh, as he's sort of signing off there from the Fortress of Solitude. But beggars can't be choosers. Uh, I went with a, a pretty solid seven out of 10, which is about a point higher than where I was last week where I was sitting at a, at a six out of 10. So seven out of 10, my final score for music for parts one and two. What about you? Yeah, I I'll keep where I was at the at the six out of ten. Uh, I, uh, like I said, I did like it. I do think that moment in the UN is uh, is really fantastic. That was that was the definite standout to me. And like I said, other than that and the uh, the the sort of dramatic phantom zone accompanying music, I think was also was also pretty cool. So uh, definitely strong effort across our two parts. Two of our three uh, dynamic music partners. There we go. All right, Liam, let's move on to our final category, which is going to be voice acting. And uh, we don't we don't have a large uh, derivation from our cast from last week. I don't think uh, other than maybe Perry White, I don't think we had any additional voices uh, that weren't already existing in last week's episode. So this may be a short but sweet summary of our cast this week. But uh, we did get the introduction of, as we mentioned last week, Ron Perlman as uh, this this role, uh, a very different role than we are used to from from hearing him before, but uh, certainly uh, equally strong uh, performance from Mr. Perlman. Uh, let's let's talk about the voice cast from this week. That's right. So uh, yeah, as mentioned, not a lot going on other than a, a, a brief appearance by George Zunza as Perry White. Uh, trying to sort of stand up to Jaxer and Mala when they're uh, when they come to kidnap Lois, uh, but other than that, yeah, it's, uh, we do briefly again get uh, get Corey Burton as uh, as not only Brainiac but as as is tradition, he's also got to do a bunch of the bystander voices that we hear across <laughs> the episode. Mm-hmm. Um, but always love to hear that. We have uh, we have uh, elsewhere we. We didn't have Clancy Brown this week. That was last week. No, no Clancy this week. No, he was. Uh, yeah, he, he just has that one uh, news news report scene that uh, that uh, that sets Mala off in part one. But he's not back this week. There you Which go. again, something that <laughs> if we had structured this differently to go back to let's see what Lex's reaction is to like his nightmare scenario where the Kryptonians are invading and taking over the world. Like, right. would have been cool. Yeah, but anyway. I digress. We're in voice acting now. So, of course, we once again have Victor Brandt as uh, as Professor Hamilton. This is probably the most, certainly across these two parts, the most he's gotten to do because he's not just there to say some Superman this week. Like, he's a character in this episode, uh, in these two episodes. And, you know, we get him him kind of going through the uh, the entrance to the fortress and he's got his own uh, deep sea diving suit on and then he's sort of marveling at all of the creatures in the zoo and everything and uh and and then him sort of getting to interact with gets John. a little own scuba suit this week too we didn't even talk about that in visuals professor professor <laughs> hamilton's scuba suit that's right I, you know- we, we were robbed. We never got a Professor Hamilton action figure in the Kenner line. I think that this was cause enough to not only have one like standard <laughs> Professor Hamilton in lab coat with like writing down things action, but also you could then have underwater scuba suit 
<laughs> Professor Hamilton also like a variant that you could that you could sell. You see, Kenner left money on the. <laughs> They really did. They That's definitely uh, at the end there when Hasbro got it and uh-huh. they were doing those re-release four packs with like one yep. new figure in them. Yep. Give me, give me, you do, you do one with regular Hamilton and you do one with, with scuba. scuba Hamilton. Suit. And you can have scuba suit Hamilton and scuba suit Maggie Sawyer in the same set. <laughs> Man, what, what, we why need don't it? we have the, why aren't we working for a toy company? <laughs> What a set that would be! You get you get re release of Deep Sea Dive Superman. Uh huh. Uh-huh. You get you get Scuba Scuba Hamilton and Scuba <laughs> Scuba Maggie. We need a fourth. There has to be another episode. Doesn't John Corbin have like <laughs> wet gear on in an episode? And maybe in in the way of All Flash or something. I think he does. Yeah, I think there's some some deep sea diving John Corbin. <laughs> All right, there we go. Scuba Scuba John Corbin. <laughs> perfect set you see folks we told you when you break up a two-parter into two <laughs> episodes it gives us this extra time to just riff on goof <laughs> isn't this much better <laughs> oh my gosh i'm having fun i don't know <laughs> I'm having too much fun. Are too. but uh yeah so uh, <laughs> elsewhere in our cast we uh we once again have leslie easterbrook as mala and uh and of course dana delaney as lois lane and uh, as you mentioned, Cal, Ron Perlman is Superman. Of, of all our guest characters, obviously Ron Perlman gets a lot more to do this week because he's in the episode. I like him playing off of, uh, of Leslie Easterbrook. I think, I think them together is fun because she's, she's just so into the, the chaos and the destruction of it all. And he sort of, you know, seemingly is a bit more, uh, you know, even keeled at first, but then you kind of get the sense that he's, He's just as sick as her. Maybe he's just a little better at uh, at hiding the uh, the demeanor mm-hmm. in, in some way, at least mm-hmm. at first. But then uh, ultimately, they're both kind of undone by uh, by their hubris. And then Dan- <laughs> Dana Delaney has some really good lines in this one. The the line where she talks about how uh, she's going to personally lead the army that vaporizes them. I was mm-hmm. like, that's a pretty that's a pretty creative way to get around saying. <laughs> I'm gonna kill you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. I, I agreed. <laughs> I thought that was uh that was fun. And and as you said, her her kind of getting the last laugh there at the end with uh with being the one to send send them back to the phantom zone is is pretty fun as well. And I and liked yeah, her yeah. line also. She she holds unfortunately the dubious notion for having the most dated line of the episode where she <laughs> mentions the white pages, which Ooh. Kids, if you're not sure what the white pages were, there used to be these giant books that had a list of every phone number in your area code. That's right. There was a encyclopedia, and an encyclopedia was also a book of collected knowledge. So if you don't know what an encyclopedia is, you can look that up also. <laughs> Essentially, it was it was Google, but it listed people's names and phone numbers. And she says that you can't look up Jaxer and Mala in the white pages, meaning you can't just ring them on the phone. So if you didn't get that reference, didn't know what the white pages are, we are providing a service here for you. Please subscribe and uh, like all of our content as a, as a form of payment. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. Uh, but yes, then we, of course, have, uh, we have Tim Daly as Superman. And uh, he gets uh, he gets a little bit more to do, I think, in part two, because he he gets to play off both uh, both Ron Perlman and uh, and Leslie Easterbrook here. He's got some he's got some pretty good like uh, like like quippy action hero one liners. Yeah, like when uh, when uh, you know Jaxer's sort of uh, you know waxing poetic about the similarities between superman and jor-el but uh you know he figures that superman won't surrender and join their cause and he gets to tell jackson that guess you're not as dumb as you look <laughs> yeah. and then uh, as, as you mentioned there towards the end when they're uh, they're on the the bridge and the tanker with the the fuel is spilled uh Jaxer has a line something about like well you know as it turns out death might be more uh, more merciful to you than putting you back in the phantom zone and and Superman just says, "I'll take your word for it." And then he, yeah. he lights it up, and I think that's that's really fun and action heroy. And and then, uh, as you said, he gets he gets the 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 really good you know case closed line at the end, <laughs> parole, uh, parole revoked. Like that's that's just like straight up Stallone or something like that. Absolutely, 
that's straight out of there. So I, I, li- I like seeing him get to play uh, play a little bit more of a, you know, a, a badass in this episode. A little bit, he has a little bit more uh, more to do and a little bit more of those pithy action hero lines than maybe we're used to seeing from a Superman. Bye bye. No! Yeah, I love it. It sort of sort of lends to the the other side of the Superman character, and and super, and Tim Daly does a, a fantastic job in delivering the lines in in this episode mm-hmm. because it doesn't feel cliched. It feels it just feels like Superman, despite the fact that Superman is, as we talked about last week, uh, is very uh, selfless and th- thinking of others and, and kind and looking for the, for the good and other people and, and kind of looking to that first, we, we get, he does have a tipping point and he's at this point, he's at his tipping point. He's, he's about done. Um, we see that in other episodes, you know, with dark side, we see that, uh, for the Superman character, even though it's, 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 uh, voiced by George Newbern later on, but we see certainly some of that in Justice League. But you see that when that f- switch flips with Superman, where he's not going to be Mister Nice Guy anymore. Like he tried, he's done. Like he's he's out of patience. So I love uh, when in in this this episode those lines sort of just communicate that that being done with <laughs> with Jaxer and Mala and just ready to to send them back to the Phantom Zone. He's no longer hesitant. Mm-hmm. He's no longer interested in trying to reform either of them. It's just back to the Phantom Zone where you started. Like this was a mistake. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I, I love that. I love the chemistry that he that he has with Ron Perlman in this episode. Um, as you mentioned, some of that back and forth, and uh, and uh, again him with him with Professor Hamilton. So I think there's some really strong performances in this week. Um, I was sitting at a seven out of ten last week. You were as well, um, but I bumped my voice acting up to an eight out of ten this week just because I thought. Ron Perlman's really strong, very not, uh, very unsurprising as we know. Uh, you know his his turn as Clayface is one of the more iconic performances in Batman the Animated Series, and so we're well aware that he's more than capable of of putting on an incredible performance. This is a little bit different, very uh, if, if pun intended, less dramatic in mm-hmm. some ways than than the Clayface character. Very uh, very stoic, less emotionless, I would say. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he's, he is that military man, war general that is, is conf- self-confident, overconfident in some ways. Um, so it's a little bit different, uh, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that it was distracting in, in some of the ways that we've said that, uh, other, other voice actors, when they're playing uh, a different character than the one that we're familiar with or most familiar with tend to be, I think that this was, this was fit in there perfectly and, and felt like its own own character in a way so uh yeah mm-hmm. i ended up giving voice acting an eight out of ten for this week what about you yeah i think i uh i think i was just so enjoying i think yeah him playing off of tim daly and some of the like we already talked about the fun stuff that uh, that tim daly and dana delaney get to do in this episode and uh my uh kind of a continued enjoyment of of, uh, of of leslie easterbrook as mala i ended up going a little bit higher i went uh I went nine out of ten for my uh, for my voice score. I think I think this episode's a lot of fun, and I think this one kind of brings it up. And I, I even like like we talked about that Superman reacting to uh, to Professor Hamilton coining the Fortress of Solitude phrase is very funny, <laughs> and does give you kind of even though this is a two parter, it kind of bookends the episode mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, with with for you know the start of the episode is them going to the fortress and and. You know, he kind of cocks an eyebrow when uh, when uh, when Hamilton calls it that, and then at the end when he's putting the projector back and sort of uh, uh, talking out loud to uh, to himself and to the animals in the zoo, he he kind of uh, he's not he's not so sure about that phrase, but uh, he he kind of likes it the way he kind of the way he kind of just nicely puts a puts a button on it and gives you your uh, your your happy ending as he you know pet pets the. Uh, pets the creatures and then swims off back towards uh back towards civilization i think it's uh, tim daly does uh, just a really really great job in this episode and i think i think him combined with our our, 
and then Dana Delaney really brought it up a little bit extra for me this week. There you go. All right, Liam. Well, that will whoa that sound. Before we get to our final totals, we are going to award a bonus point. Well, we meaning I, I am going to award a bonus point for this week's episode. And uh, it is the for the aforementioned scene where Superman arrives uh, to save the day at the UN Security Council. Um, as I mentioned in as we were talking about it in, in music and also talked about it in visuals. Um, it's it's just a great scene. It's everything you want from a from a surprise arrival from Superman. Just when everything seems like uh, it's it's gone to hell in a handbasket, even though we already knew that he had escaped the Phantom Zone at that point, uh, it is it is pretty awesome to see the the villains get their just desserts and be surprised. And as I said, everything about it from him just sort of floating there and slowly coming in, Tim Daly delivering the line, I wouldn't do that. Uh, quite yet if I were you and then the music swells we get the 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 Superman the animated series Shirley Walker theme come in very strong just superb it's just everything that you want from a scene so because the fact that I got goosebumps alone on that watch I felt like it I was like ah, that deserves a bonus point because it gave me goosebumps that's really good so I love that <laughs> I love a bonus point for goosebumps. <laughs> that's as good of a reason for it. It's, it's also a great point. And what, what we talk about all the time, why we break down the show into these four separate categories, because, mm-hmm. you know, it's not just one thing that makes these cartoons going back and re- revisiting, you know, some 25 to 30 years after they've debuted. It's, it's stuff like that. And it's moments where, it's the voice acting, it's the music, it's the animation, it's it's all of it. It's it's such a great moment. And like we said, that's that's like the most dire things fear feel when you have like the the UN secretary or whoever he is, mm-hmm. the spokesman for planet Earth, <laughs> uh, about to turn the world over to uh, to our villains, and then Superman kind of arrives just at the last second and you know, you know, talks about how, you know, I wouldn't sign that just yet. And then the music kicks in and then you kind of pan up and you hear all of the, you know, all the, the background actors are, Oh, he's back. He's back. Everything like we're saved. Like it's, it's just this really nice moment where, where you feel like, I mean, it's, it's, it's over, it's over. It's spoken about ad nauseum at this point when it relates to Superman. But the, when you look at that character is like, you know, the world's fireman, the guy that's, that's bringing you hope and that's going to, it's gonna, you know, everything's gonna be okay now because Superman's here. Like, I think that's that's a great encapsulation of that in that moment, and it's all of our various categories that we talk about working together. Um, absolutely. All right, Liam. Uh, well, now once we uh, we look at our total scores now, including my bonus point here, we end up with a. 29 well, at least i do i end up with a 29 out of 40 what about you and i end up just one point lower at uh, 28 out of 40 all right well i think it's pretty well established based on the fact that these characters once again return <laughs> you get the origin of the fortress of solitude name here so that's pretty important we get scuba suit Emil <laughs> hamilton uh <laughs> <laughs> I anything guess. that adds to the professor hamilton lore that we have that we have constructed over the last two weeks i think it's right. gonna it's gonna bump this into a into a must watch i i'd say <laughs> i'd say based on the impact of these characters to the series and uh and even though they don't return outside of superman the animated series we did talk about and uh, if you check out our social media at dcau review plenty of tie-in material featuring jaxer and mala so mm-hmm. Uh, I think I think this is a, this is a must watch based on the fact that we kind of get everybody's backstory and we get the we get a pretty interesting Superman tale here. So I'd, I'd say overall DCAU, this is probably a, a must watch based on the impact that it leaves Superman and and uh, this this series, at least. Yeah, I agree. It's a, it's a fun two part adventure. And then it's a it's a good episode of the series. You've got a villain that comes comes back yeah i think this is a this is definitely a must watch a two thumbs up there you go all right thank you everyone for tuning in this week we appreciate you listening don't forget 
Uh, if you'd like to support us, head on over to DCAU Review, both on Twitter and on Instagram at DCAU Review. Uh, follow us on Twitter or uh, so, you know, like us on Instagram, follow us on Instagram. Uh, those are both ways to interact with us. Also, as we talked about uh, earlier in the program, uh, thank you to everybody that has said incredibly kind things or, or shared their thoughts or shared kind words and and comforting words this week. Um, you know, as we mentioned at the top of the show, we did our, our Kevin Conroy tribute show. It was, uh, it was something we threw together rather quickly, sort of in the moment after hearing about uh, Mr. Conroy passing away very tragically. And, um, you know, we, we were very raw and shared our emotions and shared some thoughts and it's, it's real. It's, it's very, very real. It's maybe the realest episode uh, an unfiltered podcast. I'll just say that we didn't, we didn't pretend we didn't fake anything. It was very real and raw emotion. So thank you to anybody that took time this week and listened to that and, uh, and said, sent some kind words. If you haven't listened to it, we invite you to take a listen to it and, uh, you know, continue sharing your thoughts. You know, obviously, uh, we're going to continue this podcast. We talked about that on the on the show for as long as we can, um, and uh, we're going to continue talking about the 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 impact that Mr. Conroy had on our lives and the lives of so many fans uh, that have have co- you know come out and shared so many great things about him and in interactions at at comic cons or through cameo or you know a, a, a myriad of different. Uh, things that people have shared, you know, that the voice actors that got to work with him, artists that, that were, that worked on comic books that, that were inspired by him and his performance, mm-hmm. just uh, it, seeing how many lives he touched this week was, was, was pretty incredible. And, and for us to, to have a, a tiny glimpse at that and hear some of the stories uh, that some of the people that, that listen to our show and our program uh, sharing those with us was was a really really neat opportunity and and to me it was a, was very cathartic it was it was very therapeutic uh, to to see some of those things and to share in in our grief with each other as a community and and uh, mm-hmm. and also celebrate Mr. Conroy's life so thank you to everybody that has tuned in and and checked that out you can hear that on all of our all of our, our platforms where our podcast is shared, including youtube.com slash the pod tower. And uh, of course, Apple and Spotify and Google podcasts as well. Yeah, ab- absolutely. It was uh, really, really cannot, can honestly say I've never experienced anything like that. Um, emotionally uh, from like, like I think we talked about on the show from a, uh, from a celebrity death. And then, um, like we said, just the outpouring of support, not only for for our show and for our episode, but just just people sharing. Um, it just it was very genuine and it was very uh, it was very raw. And uh, you know, if if we were able to you know help some people, maybe uh, who who weren't quite sure how to put it into words, um, we're uh, we're very we're very happy that we were able to kind of. Uh, let you, let you guys in on on how we were feeling and and uh, and help try to celebrate such a such an incredible person's life and uh, and again if if we helped you that's great and it, the feeling is is absolutely mutual um, just some of the messages that we, that were shared with us this week were incredibly touching and uh, again not just about our show but just interactions like you said that people had had with Kevin and. And all that it was uh it was really beautiful and um it uh it maybe restored a little bit of my faith in in humanity and the internet uh just seeing how how many people came together to uh to use their powers for good and to sort of collectively help each other through what is uh you know it's uncharted waters we've never we've never like i said never really experienced anything like that so uh, thanks to everybody for for saying such nice things and for and for being so open and honest with uh, with how you were feeling as well. Absolutely. And if you'd like to continue sharing, as we mentioned, um, you can either send us a, a DM on Instagram or on on Twitter or tweet at us or comment on uh, our pinned post is the on Instagram is our um, is our is our post uh, talking about our our episodes. So you can feel free to leave comments on there. We also have uh, have gathered as many of the, the tributes and continue to gather them in our Instagram story highlights. So you can check that out. There's a Conroy tribute section that we have highlighted there. So you can go check some of those out, including some of the great things that people shared with us um, at ways that, that Kevin Conroy really, really impacted them. 
Liam, let's uh, let's let's segue here as we continue talking. Thank you, everybody, for for continuing to listen and support in the ways that you do. Subscribe to the pod, or or whether you subscribe to us on on a on a podcast platform or on YouTube, or uh, if you just listen to us, thank you so much for doing so. We would definitely appreciate a su- subscribe. Uh, don't forget also uh, if you're if you're looking to support the podcast, you can follow us on social media at DCAU Review. Liam, we will be continuing next week, I believe, with yet another Superman the Animated Series review here as we are we are dwindling slowly but surely here with our, with our Superman coverage. But we have one more Saturday here in the month, and uh, we may or may not be dropping some bonus content for our Black Friday special next week, so be on the lookout for that as well. But uh, next Saturday, we will wrap up the month with our Superman reviews. That's right, Cal, and uh, we will be bringing back the uh, the character spotlight format next week. And uh, seeing that, as you mentioned, this is still a Superman the Animated Series focus month, we thought we'd pick one of the uh, the top Superman villains from across this series, uh, one of whom we've covered sort of all of his major appearances of to date, and that is, of course, Metallo, uh, Mr. <laughs> the fourth guy in our... <laughs> <laughs> Our deep sea diver Superman has broke Kenner four pack. Uh, John Corbin himself, obviously a big villain. He's really he's the first super villain. Mm-hmm. You know, he as before he's turned even turned into Metallo. He's uh, he's the finale of the very first uh, first episode or three episodes of, of Superman. So pretty integral a villain in the series and uh, one I look forward to talking about. And uh, also looking into some of his action figures and comic book tie-ins and all that fun stuff that we get to do when we look at the uh, the character spotlight episodes. Uh, So we'll be bringing you one on Metallo next week. Can't wait to cover that with you, Liam. It's going to be great. As we mentioned, don't forget, check out the feed for potential Black Friday episode dropping next week along with our regular episode next Saturday. It's going to be awesome. But until then, I'm Cal. We'll talk to you on the next episode of the DC Indian. Bye-bye.